Hello and welcome. My name is Simonon. I'm a historian and author of the book Education for Humanity. In today's video, we're going to be looking at the human story, and I'm delighted uh, to have with me Pliny Sukumani, who is a historian and historical reenactor. Hello, Pliny. Hello, Simon. Good to see you and good to be here with you. Indeed. And Pliny is an expert on Napoleon, which is the subject of today's video. But here's the difference with our approach in the human story. Three things are emphasized. Number one, the global context, so we understand what's going on over the whole world, not just the particular topic we're looking at. Number two, we look at the way that the various characters and actors understood their world in which they lived, what's called the mentalité. And so rather than judge it by the 21st century standards, we get a deeper understanding. And number three, we look at the character traits, which can sometimes be quite contradictory in the key characters, and thus form a more holistic and rounded and deeper view of the history we're studying. So that's the ambition today. And without further ado, can I ask you, Pliny, to describe the world in which Napoleon lived? Yes. Well, we need to understand first that at the time, France was still a very major power, almost a superpower. But it has been in conflict for over 100 years with Britain. Now it was also a global conflict. So to a certain extent, we can sense that Napoleon was kind of following a traditional French policy. And if we look at the map of the 18th century, we find that this global conflict have encompassed different areas on different continents all around the world, from Canada, South Africa, Mauritius, from where I'm from, uh, to India. However, what was different this time was that the wars were now fought in the name of the Republican ideals. The French people wanted to export the ideals of the Republic, freedom, equality, fraternity, not just to its borders, country bordering itself, but to the whole of Europe, if not the world. And we got to understand as well that uh, the spur of the revolution came from the American Revolution and ideas from the Enlightenment. And uh, Napoleon was born 20 years before these tectonic shifts in 1769. Some of the new trends that we find at the time was the birth of the Industrial Revolution that started in Britain. It started a lot later in France under Napoleon's nephew, uh, but at the time of Napoleon's, it was Britain who was starting to be the industrial power, while France was much more agricultural power. Thank you for that, Penny. You mentioned the struggle between Britain and France. Looking more broadly, was there a particular alignment or constellation of, of great powers that, that shaped the ambitions and military campaigns of Napoleon? Uh, certainly. Well, if we look back again at the map, we see this enormous patch of territory, which was the Ottoman Empire, it looked amazing on paper. It looks huge, powerful. However, it was in stagnation. It was in such stagnation that Napoleon invaded Egypt, trying to march to India, emulating his hero, uh, Alexander. And we also see another huge colonial power. That was Spain, with territories stretching from California to South America, to Tierra del Fugo by the time of Napoleon. And Spain was unfortunately also in stagnation 
promoting against Napoleon over time to take advantage of an instability in Spain. Now, if we look at Europe, Germany, as we know today, did not exist. It was a myriad of little states. There was two major powers, Austria and Prussia, and Prussia, a great military power, was already past its sell by date, but nobody knew it at the time. But one power, one power that was on the ascent was certainly the British. The British, thanks to the Industrial Revolution, its financial sector, and also importantly, being able to project power with the Royal Navy. Thank you very much for that. That really puts it into some kind of, of context and we can see how Napoleon was able to take advantage of it and also be challenged, as you say, by Britain's rising power. So let's focus a little bit on Napoleon and his world. Can you explain what kind of worldview, what kind of mentality Napoleon had growing up as a young man and also what social expectations would have been placed on Napoleon? Yeah, uh, so let's look at the social and family expectations. Well, in those days, uh, it was the duty of a father to provide the family to find the jobs or to make sure that they were stable. And we need to remember as well that Napoleon came from Corsica, whereby the family bonds will even be stronger being seen as a clan. So when Napoleon was providing for his brothers and sisters, because he was the head, the de facto head of a family, it should have been Joseph, the eldest son, but Napoleon career-wise and his personality was far more stronger. And he was simply providing for his family by making them kings and queens and giving them position of power. It would be seen to death nepotism, but at the time, it would be seen as simply being his duty. And also Napoleon was thinking that he could control them a lot more, which was not the case. And we got to remember as well that the society of the time was in a flux. The certainties of the Ancien Regime were shaken, first by the American Revolution, and then with the nascent French Revolution. Napoleon's world, initially, it was framed by the ideas of honor and glory from the Ancien Regime. Over time, he would be espousing the ideals of the revolution. He was the general that saved the revolution. Yeah. And we need also to think that during that time, the people in France so enormous, enormous parallels between ancient Rome and France. Ancient Rome got rid of its king, became a republic, and transitioned into an empire that ushered a golden age. They thought the French Revolution was going through the same process. And also there was a parallel that ancient Rome was an agricultural power, was a land power and was in a life and death struggle with Carthage, but was a commercial power and naval power. Again, we see the parallel between France and Britain. I'm with you. Well, thank you very much for that explanation. You mentioned transition, and I'm wondering, as Napoleon gained power, as he became established in his rule of of France with all those military conquests to follow, do you think his worldview changed? Um, yes, I think that over time he did become increasingly conservative uh, and also to a point where he married into one of the oldest aristocratic families in Europe, the Habsburg. Uh, there was, it was for political reasons, certainly, uh, but he did marry. Uh, into one of the oldest uh, monarchy in Europe. But we need to remember that at the time of his rule, there was also the abolition of feudalism, the Inquisition, the Holy Inquisition, this repressive organ was abolished in Spain. The Code Napoleon was introduced, or in the days it was known as the Civil Code, um, 
His Prime Minister Cambaceres, who was a gay man, worked on that code tirelessly, but Napoleon insisted to participate in almost half of the sessions to elaborate this code, which is one of the greatest legacy of his today, because it's still being used in many countries of Europe and also in other French colonies. The law in the Napoleon Code applied to all the citizens, irrespective of your birth, this is seen today as being the norm. But in the days prior to the revolution, if you were a noble, you would be exempt from taxes. You will be trialed by laws that, was, that would be more lenient to you. So having a law that applied to everybody equally was indeed revolutionary. But one of the darker parts of the, of the Napoleon Code was also that in the family, Napoleon codified, codified that women were subordinate to their husbands. Indeed, in mm -hmm. those days, uh, societies were run on a patriarchal line, but it was not codified. So in a way, it was a reflection of the norms of the time as well. During the revolution, the, there was the abolition of titles, but Napoleon reintroduced them. They were given on merit. Anybody, you didn't have to be a noble, anybody could achieve a title of count or baron, depending on their service to the state. Uh, these titles were then passed uh, to the eldest son in the family, but they didn't confer any tax advantages or legal advantages. Here we see that Napoleon was trying to mix the old and the new, to fuse elements of the Ancien Regime and elements of a revolution. I'm with you. Well, thank you very much for that. And it, and it certainly presents an interesting picture. And it brings me on to focus to Napoleon himself and what character traits do you think he had and how did they impact on his rule? Well, one of the things is um, we know today that uh, Napoleon met an enormous amount of people during his rule. Many people then wrote books, first accounts. Many of these books were never meant for publications as well, or took or notes were not meant for publication. So over time, we have accumulated a vast amount of knowledge about the man. And whether it's from friend or foe, we know that he was served with an, an extraordinary mind, an ability that few had at the time. He worked tirelessly. He had an extraordinary mind and worked tirelessly, so much that he was able to dictate to six different secretaries on six different subjects at the same time, which is kind of a, of a feat. He was a reformer. He tried to take elements, good elements from the ancient regime, marry them with a revolution. He was a brilliant strategist. He learned the art of war at school, certainly, but he perfected it on the field. He had a brilliant ability to process a huge amount of information on the battlefield far quicker than his adversaries, and these lead to brilliant victories but he was also a control freak. And we know that over time, he just wanted his generals to follow his orders to the letter. And this would have fatal consequences at Waterloo, where Marshal Grouchy insisted to, general, to his generals that he's got a written order from Napoleon and he would not march to the sounds of the guns. He was seen also as being sometime an opportunist. And we know that uh, to his discredit, he reintroduced slavery that was abolished by the revolution. But then in 1815, he also abolished slavery again. But what is interesting is unlike the other heads of state or ministers of Europe at the time, Napoleon emitted regrets of having reintroduced slavery when he was in exile in St. Helena 
in talking to somebody who have suffered under slavery. We know also that Napoleon had this trait of wanting to win at all cost. He would cheat at games of cards where money was involved with his aides or generals. But it's also interesting that when he won, he was distribute his money or winnings to people in his circle, or, but also to his uh, personal bodyguard, a Mameluk from Egypt. We know that from Napoleon dealing, he would often reward people who have helped him in harder times when he was a student or who have lent him money when he was poor. There was also an inability to compromise in 1813, in 1814. There was offers of peace from the powers, but Napoleon refused on the grounds that he would not give up the conquest of a revolution. He thought his regime will not survive, but the people of France were clamoring for peace as well. And finally, we know but he was a little bit mischievous. Uh, he loved to play with kids. And in St. Helena, he befriended a young girl called Betsy Balcon. He came to know that Betsy was afraid of ghosts. And one day he decided to get one of the servants with a bed sheet on top of his head and to scare the poor little child. Uh, and they all had a good laugh afterwards, Betsy, the parent, and her mother. So I think it's interesting to see the human uh, element of Napoleon as well. Indeed, it's a, it's a fascinating portrait. How do you think people at the time saw Napoleon? Uh, that's a very, very interesting question. Um, well, let's go to France first. We know that he was hugely popular as a general of a start, of a general of a revolution. And the people wanted him to come to save the revolution. The directory of the regime before his was corrupt, was bankrupt. There was no money in the coffers. So when Napoleon got power, he stabilized France. But importantly, he brought peace. He brought peace with all the different powers in Europe, including Britain. This, unfortunately, did not last very long. And by 1814, you know, the people were kind of tired, uh, tired of the taxes, tired of having their sons being taken for war, never to be seen again. But we need to remember that uh, in 1815, during the 100 days, there was again a huge, huge popular support for Napoleon. Napoleon landed in the south of France with only 1,000 men, 1,000 in the south of France, and marched to Paris without firing a gunshot. There was huge support. Now, in other parts of Europe, Napoleon was seen initially as a liberator. In Italy, in Germany, he was fated, and Beethoven wrote um, his symphony, uh, dedicated it to Napoleon. Napoleon met Goethe, who they both had a great interaction. Goethe was then awarded the Legion of Honor. Uh, the Germans were welcoming of uh, the revolutionary fervor of uh, France, but that did not last long because of the increasing requisitions in terms of supplies, food, and also of the Allied states having to supply men for the different wars. Uh, in Poland, the people there view him again as a liberator. Poland had been partitioned by the main powers. At the time, Poland did not exist. But Napoleon reformed a Polish state. And in fact, today, it's interesting to see that the national anthem of Poland mentioned Napoleon. And, uh, you know, over time again, the relationship soured because of requisition of men and supplies. So that's in general the ideas that people had of Napoleon in France and outside of France. So, thank you for that, Benny. What we have here is a quite a complex character, certainly not somebody that can be reduced to simple caricature like the cartoon behind us. I mean, neither a tyrant nor the saviour of 
Europe. But somebody who's dealing with conflicting forces, there's his restlessness, endless energy, military campaigns, but also trying to produce order and stability. And maybe his difficulty in compromising made that difficult, if not impossible to achieve. And then we have somebody who could change his mind. Um, you mentioned slavery, which was very interesting. Firstly, he abolishes the Roman Revolution, then he imposes it. I'm interested that the uh, Marmaluk bodyguard that you mentioned, uh, Rustam Raza, was a slave that he freed. So, in terms of action, speaks louder than, than, than words. So, like all characters, they don't necessarily fit into to straightforward boxes, as it were. And the other thing I suppose I notice about him is that if we look back of, of what remains of Napoleon today, that all the military glories are gone. Where are they? Most of his conquests were lost in 1815. What remains today, of course, is the Napoleonic Code, which is not only the law in France, but also in a number of European countries, or at least the basis for law in a number of European countries. And that also, I think, is an important lesson uh, for historians in assessing somebody's uh, contribution to the human story. So this was definitely a complex and sometimes conflicting one, but a fascinating one. And I thank you for everything you've shared. So we hope people have enjoyed this video. There's another one using those three approaches, global context, worldview, constituent strands of character. Richard III may be interested. And then we've done a general video on the human story and particularly all the voices which, unlike Napoleon or Richard III, have been left out of history. So there's all that to look at on our YouTube channel, Education for Humanity. And then we have a website, educationforhumanity.co.uk, educationforhumanity.co.uk. Very welcome to come and visit and uh, have a look at our book, Education of Humanity. And with that, a big thank you to Pliny for all you've contributed, and hopefully we shall see you again.